thank you, Rick, for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank the gracious president of the university, who's been wonderful. And uh, special thanks to the committee, the organizing committee, as well as uh, Rhonda and Jen, who have been uh, absolutely great. So this is my first time here. And coming in, it was snowing. So I said, well, I'm not sure where this boat's here. But then I went to the uh, reception last night, and I've, I haven't seen enthusiasm like this around about cannabis. It restored my faith that the snow didn't matter. In fact, this morning, I got a chance to look at the beautiful mountains around. And what a, what a great place to be. So many thanks for the invitation. And uh, let me see. So I have uh, been involved in cannabis for a number of years, more than 30. And recently, recently means the last dozen years, I have been at uh, Northeastern University. And at Northeastern University, we set up a center. And the center revolves around cannabinoids, endocannabinoids, and cannabis. And as you've heard from Dr. Meshulam before me, this business is interdisciplinary. So, we try to put all the components in here and to have how we can use this for the purpose of cannabis and also for the purpose of drug discovery. So of course you have to make these compounds before you even isolate them. So you do a lot of synthetic chemistry. But then when you take these, you want to see how they work. So you do some biochemistry and some carbonics and nanotechnologies. We do a lot of computational chemistry, a lot of biophysics, and pharmacology, put it in animals, etc. We try to combine all of these within the center. And, and here, what we're trying to do is discover new medications, but also we want to develop methods and approaches so we can study cannabis. So we have now all the tools here which allow us to study cannabis, and it's important, of course, not only to know the ingredients of cannabis, but you want to know how cannabis works. We're very interested in that, and we're pursuing this because we have the tools to do this. Now, about the story here of cannabis in the Western world, and you've heard about the story of China, and actually China very early, and then also in India, but in the Western world, things happened relatively slowly, and one could divide them in two approaches. It was known that cannabis was used to cure things, to help out with some diseases, etc. So scientists, especially pharmacologists, had been interested in finding out more about it. And there were good labs established in England, but also chemists as soon as they became aware that there's interesting things going on there, they started to develop some chemistry. And there were some pretty very good early chemistry, so then Alexander Todd, and then Roger Adams here at the University of Illinois. And of course, it's culminated in, uh, in, in, in 64 with Dr. Mishulam identifying the structure in full. There were some issues that had to be resolved as well. So it was established then as a good structure. So, at the same time, pharmaceutical industry here in the U.S. were very interested because, well, maybe we can make drugs that are related to cannabis. And they worked pretty hard. Several of the major companies, like Pfizer and Lilly and Abbott, and they made a lot of new compounds. What they wanted is to get compounds that are good for analgesia. And, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Lilly made compound which is still very valuable, it's called nabalone. It's a very potent compound. It's, it's about 
20 to 50 times more potent than THC itself. And it's still used, although it has limited use today. What happened, though, is the companies were very reluctant to put these compounds out, these drugs out. Some of them because they had side effects. Some of them, cannabis really didn't have a good name in the pharmaceutical industry. You know, the pharmaceutical industry is pretty conservative. They don't want to develop a bad reputation. Pfizer had worked pretty hard. They developed some very good compounds. In fact, these uh, compounds were used later, one of them, to discover the receptor. So up to then, although there was a lot of effort, we still didn't know how these compounds work. And it took several years, sometime in the mid-80s, where we finally understand how cannabis works. At least, were most of the ingredients of cannabis. And the way it started out is, uh, and I'm happy that I had a, a little bit of a role in this, the, uh, the, the NIH wanted to revitalize the research on cannabis. And they asked me to put together a, uh, a conference where we invited people who were working in cannabis. There were not really a lot there. But during that meeting, it was very critical <coughs> that people got together. And actually, that's how discoveries happen, when people get together. So we got together, and the players in that meeting ended up being very crucial to the discovery of the target of the cannabinoid receptor. And the way this happened, we had a pharmacologist, Sabin Howlett, who, who was able to measure these things in, in uh, tissue. Uh, we had people who cloned the receptor, this Amatsuda. We did some work in identifying that this is a, a protein, and we showed that it's a protein, etc. There's a very capable uh, scientist who works on imaging, and he had the first image of the receptors in the right brain, Miles Hulkenham. So as you see, it was a joint effort, and things happened pretty fast after that. The, uh, the receptor was cloned. Uh, the second receptor was found by a group in England, and then also, of course, since we don't have cannabis in our body, the question is, how do they work? There must be some compounds there that trigger uh, these events, and that's how the endocannabinoids were discovered. So, let's talk about cannabis. And uh, some some facts here. So a lot of the business of production happens, as you know, in these strike calls. There's a lot of compounds being built. It's like a, a factory there. They make all these compounds. And you know a lot about agricultural hemp. And uh, silk, by the way, uh, is being used, etc. Or CBD became an important uh, item there. But hemp was being practiced, the use of hemp was being practiced in the, in the US, but also in Italy. There is a place called Carmagnola there, and I visited them, and, and they do make things from hemp. Believe it or not, they make jam from hemp, they make ice cream from hemp, they make pasta from hemp. They gave me a couple of packages of pasta which I cooked, they, they taste good. <laughs> so, uh, now, now, regarding the bioactive constituents, you see that the key ones are CBD, PACA, all of these, you see how diverse the activities are. And they work in different types of targets, like 5 p one and 5-HT1A, very complex, which makes the case that really there's more studies, and, uh, and we're working on that. And, and we all recognize what this molecule is, delta 9 THC, and we all recognize the leaf here, which by the way was constructed by a And then the effects of cannabis. We know that it's good for the treatment of migraines, and redness in the eyes, alleviates asthma symptoms, relaxes muscles, relieves nausea, heart rate, meaning that there are receptors in these things. Because all of these events happen because there are receptors in these organs. And let me again mention there are two receptors 
I'll talk about them, CB1 and CB2. And all of these things are initiated because THC reacts, actually THC reacts with both receptors, both the CB1 and the CB2, and produces all of these effects. Now, how do they get made? They get produced from a pathway where a lot of terpenes are being made from, like chemic acid, and then with the help of some, some energy, and some glucose and sugar pieces, they end up forming two templates. One is there under the polyacid, acid, from one way, the other is from the balonic acid. Then you can take these, put them together, and you get this, this piece here, CBGA, which is, as a lot of you know, is the centerpiece of forming all the other cannabinoids. And here we go, CBGA, and we know that these enzymes, we have the synthase, the different synthases here, CBGA synthase, CBC synthase, CBCA synthase, and then through these you go to THCA, which is the compound that's formed in the plant, and as you've heard, this is not what we take, but if this piece here, carboxylic acid goes away, and it gives us THC. But you see they have three different paths. So we have delta 9, delta 8, CBNA, which is a cannabis mole. See this ring here now is all saturated, unsaturated. And we have the cannabigerol, etc. So everything is produced in these trichomes. And I showed you now how the chemicals can get together. And each one has specific enzymes. So now people are trying to clone these enzymes, perhaps they can manufacture cannabis on their own by playing games, playing tricks, having the microbes working on it. Are we close to that? Not really for production, but very interesting. Now, the classification here is uh, we have the NITHC, the first and the most one here, very recently, very recently, cannabidiol is taking a very important position in this field. And of course, cannabidiol, cannabidiol and THC are almost equipotent. Cannabidiol, on the other hand, is related to THC, but it's not very important in the ways we measure THC. Then we have can I gerol, can I chromine, can I cycle, can I dissolve, can I triol, and of course can I diol. Now, there's been a lot of interest in finding out what these other ingredients do. And there's a fair amount of work, and uh, a number of people are exploring these, uh, make some of these, etc. We, we in our lab, we've made all of these, and we like to put tags on them, we put deuteria on them, so when you come to analyze them, then you could use these, these tag compounds to give you more accurate measurement of these ingredients, including THC. This is an important reaction here. This is THC, and then when it's taken, it becomes oxidized, by putting a hydroxy group here, instead of math, it becomes CH2OH, it's called lamp hydroxy delta 9 THC. Very potent, more potent than THC itself, about five times more potent in certain measurements. And the next step is it becomes more oxidized, it becomes the carboxylic acid. That one is not very active. And actually, the carboxylic acid is a way with which forensic medicine uses to measure the amounts of THC. Chemistry of all of these has been worked out. We've done a fair amount of these in my lab. And to talk about CBD, uh, let, let's look at it a little bit here. So this is THC here. And, and this is what a chemist would call has absolute configuration. It has, it is one-handed configuration. If you make the, uh, the mirror image of it, which would be a minus THC, it doesn't do anything. So the minus THC, very, very important, 
the plus THC, nothing. It means that these molecules must fit in a very special way, somewhere. Now, for CBD, it's a bit of a different story. And see what it takes you. If you come in, you see this bomb here, the chemical bomb, if you just break it, right there, you get CBD. So CBD and THC have exactly the same formula, but they are different molecules. And you could go, there are ways where one could go from CBD to THC. And the chemistry of this has been studied. In fact, some people think that a lot of the effects we get from, or some of the effects we get with CBD, if you ingest CBD, it transforms itself to THC, etc. Uh, let's look at a little more on CBD. So you see here, you can turn it around. See now, once we broke this bond, these two pieces, they can turn around. Turn around means they can assume different conformations, different features there. So if we look at THC now, this is delta 9. And here, if we turn it around, this is CBD. And you see, once we put it this way, once we turn it around, they don't look the same anymore because it had a chance to turn around and it likes to sit in a comfortable position, energetically favorable, and that's why we are different. Now, there's another piece there in the cannabis, as we all know. Uh, so, an important part of THC is this table here. It's five cards, one, two, three, four, five. And, and actually, if you play around with this tail, if you make molecules of the chip tail, which is different, you can make it much more potent or less potent. We have made compounds that are 500 times more potent than THC itself just by playing with this tail here. We go in the lab and we cook them and we make them. They can be very, very potent. On the other hand, the plant has also another set of compounds. Instead of having these five carbons, both for CBD and THC, they have three carbons. And they're called cannabinoid. And these now are being explored as potential, potentially interesting molecules. Made all of these and, and working on it. We don't know the full story of it there. Now, what about, what about cannabinoids that are used for therapy? Well, there's not a lot of them really that are used approved by the FDA being used for therapy. As you see here, we have retinol THC has been approved and manufactured called Maragol. It's minus retinol THC. It's made by lab, Roxanne Labs. And you could take it as pills, as uh, capsules in oil. Um, from what I hear, it doesn't really work that great. Uh, it's uh, much better if it's smoked and you get a better effect there. So it's not a highly recommended drug, although it's approved by the FDA, and it may be useful for people who, for political or, or perhaps uh, reasons of uh, social reasons, they don't want to smoke, so they take the THC here. That is a company in the called GW Pharmaceuticals, and GW has been very clever. They have been making some products from cannabis itself. And out of these, they were able to get some medications out, not really a lot. But this one has received some attention. 50% THC, 50% CBD. And it's supposed to be working for multiple sclerosis. It hasn't really gotten an approval again for that in the US. It's approved in Canada, etc. Uh, my take on this is uh, the, the full effect of this is not exactly perfect and perfectly described. But it is a drug. Get it in Canada, not here. Now, the most potent of these drugs, and I made a, a reference to it early on, is an old drug. It's called the Adenine, or the It was made by Eli Lilly. It's a very good molecule. Maybe I estimate maybe 30 times more potent than THC. And people take it. Patients take it. Uh, people have cancer, 
and they have this pain, or if they have cachexia, you know, they have HIV, no appetite, and so on. So they take that. And now a lot of work is being done on this, including my dad. Now, okay, so, so we talked about, about cannabis, we talked about THC, and then we also talked about the fact that cannabis produces a lot of physiological effects when we take it. But why do we get these physiological effects? We get them because there is a receptor there, actually two receptors. CB1 and CB2 receptors. And I told you a little bit about how these were discovered and how they ended up affecting our understanding of how THC works. Now, we don't have THC in our bodies. Some people a few years ago would say, yeah, we don't have THC, but we don't, unless you're smoking, of course, and then you get some of it there. But, <laughs> but otherwise, uh, but we do have our own, our own set of, of cannabinoids, and they're called endocannabinoids, and these endocannabinoids, they interact with these receptors. Now the receptor is a protein. It's a protein, actually, receptors, and more specifically, we could call them G-protein coupled receptors, they, uh, they, they are in a lot of places in, in the body. Cannabinoids are not cannabinoid receptors, about 300 of them, and, and a lot of them are basis for discovering new medications. So for the THC, there are two receptors. One is called CB1, and one is called CB2. And actually, they have a lot of resemblance to each other. Now, for, for your information, what these receptors have, they, they all, all these receptors they have, this is the membrane right here. And inside here, each one of these is an amino acid. So if you think of this being a bunch of amino acids, they form helices inside, and then some of it comes out of the membrane. We have three loops intracellular, we have three loops extracellular, we have an N terminus, this looks out of the cell, and this looks inside the cell. So, so this is the CD1 receptor, and this is somehow the ligand, in this case the ligand is THC, interacts with this receptor and produces a bunch of biochemical effects, and these lead to the physiological effects. This is when you activate this compound, this is the receptor, and you get happy about it, or you have a shortness of, of breath, or your heart starts beating very, meaning that they activate these receptors that I mentioned before. The CD1 is present just about everywhere in our body. It's present in the brain, it's present in the lungs, it's present in the in the liver, it's present in the fat cells, it's present in the uterus. We have also found it in human sperm. So there are CB1 receptors in human sperm. And we know that we can modulate the effects of the human sperm by activating these receptors. On the other hand, the other friend, which is a CB2 receptor, is a little bit smaller. See, this guy has 472, this has 360, a smaller one. They look very similar, a lot of resemblance. However, the CB2 is not present to any extent in the brain. And it's mostly present in immune cells. And it turns out that a lot of its effects are to modulate the immune system. And that's why, and I'll show you some things, how we can modulate the immune system, etc. And so when we take THC, it works both ways. It activates the CB1, and it gets in the brain, but really, it gets also elsewhere. It gets in the liver, it gets in the... CB2, on the other hand, is not activated, although THC activates both of them, but since we don't have THC, I and mean, we don't have CB2 in the brain, for all practical purposes, we get it peripherally active. And you see how the distribution is here. You see here, CB1 is put in the heart, tests, the liver, ovaries, the renal glands, uh, pancreas, CNS. On the other hand, both of them are present also. And you see the CB2 is in tonsils and thymus and blood and spleen, so, but not in the brain. Okay, this is a very complicated picture. 
But you just want to get a feel, you get a feel for how these things operate. Because keep in mind that you activate this receptor and you get an effect, right? Well, this process is very complex because as you see, there are other proteins involved in there. And actually, one receptor can talk to another receptor. The CB1 can talk to a receptor called the glutamate receptor, or the G GABA receptor, or even the cholinergic receptor. So they talk to each other. It's a very complex, it's a very complex web of interactions. Now, these are the players. So we have these two receptors, CB1 and CB2, right here. And by the way, these two pieces there are part of a neuron, which is interrupted here. This is called the synapse. And this is how the neuron works. It goes from here to here. So if you stimulate the neuron, it goes all this thing goes there. So the receptor are present in the presynaptic part of the neuron. And then we have some other proteins there. We have some transport, which we have worked on this discovery, and the transport can take the endogenous ligands in and out. We don't have the full story of it, but it is useful. We've shown that you can make drugs out of this. Also, when the receptor, when the receptor is activated, it's activated by these endocannabinoids, so they are produced here, and they are produced in the membrane here, to AG and so on. So somehow there's a signal given there, and then these molecules are produced. And they are produced upon demand. If, for example, you get injured and you have pain, they produce more of these. If uh, there's some other event that happened there, they produce. They produce in this membrane. But once they produce, you can't have them hanging around for that long, because then they accumulate. So there's another system which cuts them off, deactivates them. And this is done by means of enzymes. These enzymes are here. We have a famous enzyme called FAR, fatty acid amide hydrobase. People are trying to make drugs out of this, we are. And there's another one called monoacylglycerol lipase. There's two enzymes here. And also there's another enzyme here which is very interesting. I call now, and there are uh, these enzymes that deactivate these receptors. Okay, so so let's try and compare now the uh, the endogenous compounds with the ones that are present in the plant. We call them phytocannabinoids. There they are. We talked about them for a while. Okay, that's THC. And then these are the endocannabinoids. One is called anemone, or AEA. And you see this piece here is a fatty acid. It's called arachidonic acid. You may have heard about it. But arachidonic acid is a key player in the formation of these endocannabinoids. Now, the key difference this molecule here, this fatty acid here, arachidonic acid, gets attached to this piece, makes an amide. Or if it gets attached to this piece, it's an ester and this is glycerol. So this is called an NMI, and is called to acid glycerol or to AG. These are the players. Okay. So where do they go? And how now we release these. Remember we had some event that happened, could be pain, uh, it could be some effect that had to do with the neurons. They release them. How do they get to the receptor and how do they activate it? Well, let's take a look at this. So this fellow right here, this one is an anemone. You see how it goes in there. Actually, we made this actually, we we did a lot of sketch here. We did some experiments to see exactly how it goes in. If you look at it, you see that this tail here, the very end, the tail here, sits on one of the agencies, the seven agencies. And this is helix 6. And that piece here pushes on that helix and turns it on. So we have now some idea about how these receptor gets activated. 
Here they are. These are the big layers. We have an anamide, we have two glycerol, and the number. And these are, let's call them the princes of the lipids, of the endocannabinoid lipids. There's more of them around. But these are the ones that get all the attention. 2-AG and an anamide. Now, for someone who does pharmacology, you look at these numbers here. KI. KI means how tightly this molecule attaches itself to the receptor. You measure a number, it's called a KI, a set two nanomolar, two set of Keep in mind, the lower the number, the more potent it is. So if you want to categorize these guys, they're not that old. They're somewhere in between. And they're all about the same. And they work on both CB1 and CB2. CB1 and CB2. So they have the same players, the same endogenous players. Both receptors have the same players. You will see that it might be of interest to make molecules that like only one of these receptors. Then you can have them a little more directed. Okay, I talked about the two princes, and these are all the others. All of them were a whole bunch of them. We made all of these. But why did we make them all? Because, because when, when we have a, an event in our body, we want to know what role this is playing, because all of these participate in it. So you take, you, let's say you smoke dope, okay? And you want to see what happened to your system. You take a, maybe a drop of blood, and you measure all of these guys. We've developed methods for measuring all of these. And then we get an idea, because cannabis or THC can do different things to you. Maybe sometimes people have situations where this system is disturbed. People have, for example, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is associated with the cannabinoid receptor. It was noticed that schizophrenics, they like to smoke dope. And we think that the reason they like to smoke dope is because it's a self-medication. So there are other, for example, uh, ladies who, uh, and women who, who are postpartum depression. They've had a baby, and then after the baby they get depressed, and then they get postpartum. And it turns out that the endocannabinoid system is disturbed. So this qualifies us and tells us at what point maybe they can smoke or maybe they can take another drug and so on. Um, So, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to develop ways of learning about the system. So we've developed ways of learning about how the cannabinoids work. We've developed ways about how the endocannabinoids work. So we need to make tools. That's the only way we can find out about them. That's why we've been making a lot of tools. So here is the biosynthesis. In other words, how are these made? I talked about how these are deactivated, the 2-AG and the anandamide. This is not how they are made. They're all made in the membrane. They're made in the membrane. And you see they produce these two guys, 2-AG uh, here and the anandamide here. These are the two plates. And you see they're all made by a lot of different enzymes. All of these enzymes, by the way, sit on the cell membrane. So they go through, it's like a factory, and the factory gets the signal, Signal, by the way, is calcium many times, an increase in calcium. And then the cell starts producing these molecules there. And uh, again, the one thing which uh, is, uh, let me see here. So we've worked with some of these enzymes, and we do some work with these. Uh, this is biotransformation. I talked about this here. And you see how that line gets chopped up by this enzyme, by the enzyme hydrolase. Another enzyme called NAN, the same thing. 2AG here is chopped up by another NGL. So people like me who like to do research and do all of these things, we have all of these enzymes. We clone them, we make them, and we study them. So we know a lot about these things. And actually, they're important because they will tell us at what point 
maybe smoking dope will affect these enzymes. Also, we know that there are people who have mutations of these enzymes. And they become more sensitive. So, for example, there are people who have genetically produced mutations of FAR and NGL. And these are two enzymes we worked a lot with. Now, this may predispose them to how they react to THC to cannabis. So we want to know all of these things. Now, one thing which is not being appreciated enough is that these molecules get deactivated, I told you about these enzymes, yet it means they see this bond here, they chop. They chop this bond, they chop this bond right here. But there's another way with which they get metabolized. The other way is an oxidative way. There's an enzyme called COX-2, cyclooxygenase 2. For those of you who know what Advil is, is NSAIDs, etc., they're inhibitors of COX-2. Turns out that the inhibitors cannabinoids themselves, they go through the same COX-2 and they produce something called prostaglandin. In fact, they don't produce prostaglandin, but something, a variation of prostaglandin, which we don't know what it does. We know that when we take aspirin, it is prostaglandin, we know what it does with this. However, when you look at this molecule, which is the variation of prostaglandin, we don't know. So we have made these, and now it looks like they do work for conditions of inflammation. Inflammation is a very big piece of what THC, the endocannabinoids, do. Because inflammation is the heart, is the source of a lot of dysfunction in the body. Anything that will produce an effect there, which is deleterious, is associated with inflammation, including cancer. Now, okay, so I told you about what sorts of things we do in preparation of uh, learning about THC, learning about how it works, because we want to learn how it works. If you want to have the maximum use of something, you want to know how it works. It's a much better way than just trying to, just try to invent things and, and, uh, and try and try and try. You can try, and it's good if you know how it works, you can try better. Now, the other thing we do is we try to make new compounds that can become medications. Now, both, of side, both sides of the cannabis spectrum, in my eyes, is valid. We will use cannabis for what it does, but we can also make new molecules, new compounds, new drugs that produce some of the effects of cannabis, maybe avoid some of the effects, target them. I'll give you some examples. We've been doing this a fair amount of time. And I'll give you examples of how we were able to develop some medication based on the concept of cannabis. So I'll give you three examples. One example has to do with the opposite of what cannabis does, to antagonize. The other example does the positive, the agonist. And the third example has to do with how we can excite these receptors by producing more of these endocannabinoids. And, and the way this works, by the way, let's just think about it, we have these endocannabinoids, okay? They do things there, they are our own cannabis, and then we, there is an enzyme, after they do their job, it cuts it, nothing more. Now what happens if you kill this enzyme? And these enzymes can produce continuously, etc., and you produce an, a, a more of this, uh, and then it activates the receptor, etc. And I'll show you how we have used this approach to make potential medications. So the first one is an antagonist. And then how do we make medications? How do we make medications? We make medications, you know, if you want to play around the way we do it, is we have a protein. We know that the protein in this case is a GPCR, it's CB1. And we want to see where this line goes. I showed you where an anamide goes and hits there. If we know where it goes and we know the shape, we can then produce molecules that go in there. 
So we could time frame it, get it exactly in there. And we can do, and this is how drugs are designed, by the way. Look here, you can design drugs for, for enzyme, you can do that for hormones. But they all have to do with getting a ligand inside the protein. And it's called molecular recognition. Okay, now, how can we know how it looks, what's the shape of it? There are many ways of doing this, and you have to keep trying. You put one molecule, it fits well, then you modify it, fits a little better, and you play this game, it's called medicinal chemistry. But one of the best ways of, of doing that is to have a template where you can use the template to form this and design this model. And this happened only recently. We produced a crystal structure. It's just like a, a picture of it. And using the picture, we can design molecules that fit inside the picture. So we produced the first crystal structure of the cannabinoid receptor, collaboration with a colleague, uh, Ray Stevens, University of California. And, and now we know that that's how it looks. By the way, I've seen some uh, people putting it on the poster, etc. It's been a nice picture that came out in the, in the journal Cell and tells you a lot about it. But we know now this is a molecule that we made and it fits exactly right here. So now we have a template right there, you see, where we know how this molecule works. And we could do more. We could see that this molecule now is surrounded by a lot of amino acids. This is how it works there. And then we could use it to design other molecules. See, we could design, show how these different molecules fit in there. And use this as a template. Combination then of using the crystal structure, computer, and the cooking. Cooking is when we go and make molecules. To create molecules, you have to do a lot of cooking. We like cooking. OK. Now, uh, the, uh, the cannabinoids can, uh, can provide compounds from appetite modulation, neuropathic pain, neuroprotection, somatic peripheral pain, addiction. You see a lot of these AI numbers there. We made these molecules. They're advanced. They're close to going into humans for being studied. Let me give you three examples before concluding. So, so here's a story. So obesity is a, is a problem, as we know. It's overweight, aterosclerosis, heart attack, kidney failure, obesity. And a French company by the name of Sanofi, they thought as follows. They said, well, listen, when you smoke dope, you get hungry. What if we do the opposite? If we do the opposite, the antidote, so to speak, the antidote, so to speak, then you won't get hungry. You won't get hungry, you lose weight. So they made something called a cannabinoid antagonist, a CB1 cannabinoid antagonist. And they called it a complex. This was a very interesting and powerful Discovery, the company was making big plans. They were planning to be selling about $5 billion a year, because everyone wants to lose weight, etc. And it progressed quite a bit. However, when it got to the FDA, it was approved in Europe, but in the FDA did not approve it. And the reason they did not approve it is because it had side effects. They found out that certain, not everyone, but a lot of people, uh, who took the drug had suicidal tendencies, they were getting depressed, had digestive problems, so they had to take it out. And actually the, uh, the, uh, the uh, FDA did not approve it, and, they, and actually they voluntarily also took it out in Europe. So we were thinking at the same time, we were thinking, we said, well, if you smoke dope, you get hungry, 
And if you do the opposite, you don't eat. But also, if you smoke dope, you're happy. If you do the opposite, you get depressed. That's the side effect. Now, can we make something that works as dope when it comes to food intake, but does not get depressed? So we designed it on the basis of a different concept. I'll go very quickly over this here with you. And, and this is, you know, really to understand the whole story here. But basically, when we measure some sort of a parameter in here, it's called uh, GA, GI, protein. And if you take THC, THC, when you take THC, it goes down. So this is a partial agonist. Now, if you make a more potent THC, it's a full agonist. And the compound that Sanofi had made does exactly the opposite. It's called an inverse agonist. So we said, ah, maybe we could make a compound that's somewhere in between this one and this one. And we made the first neutral antagonist. In other words, it doesn't decrease or increase the effect on the G protein. And sure enough, we tested it. So we tested the neutral antagonist. This is the first neutral antagonist that was made. And you see here, if you take a cochlea, which is the compound by Sanofi, and you see it does reduce food intake. It reduces food intake. However, if you measure the disturbances in your GI, you get nausea. And you see how you give more, you get more nausea. This was tested in rats and ferrets. So let's test our compound, which is 4113. And here it is. It does the same thing, it uses food intake, but no nausea. Aha, so we're successful. So we have now a way of affecting the system, in other words, affecting what a cochlea does without its side effects. Actually, a lot of what a cochlea does does it because it's an inverse agonist, but also because it gets in the brain. And a lot of the effects of a complete brain, when it gets suicidal tendencies, means that it went to the brain CB1 receptors. So we also thought, well, maybe we could make compounds that don't get in the brain. And we did. There's a compound which has received quite a bit of attention, GM6505, and it does work very well. And we are now trying to test it for liver fibrosis, liver diseases, and you see it doesn't go in the brain here. And the monobar is a French compound here, and it does the same, the same effects as the monobar, but it doesn't have the side effects. Okay, so, so this is, this is and, and we're developing, by the way, this, it's a longer story, and we're developing for people who have uh, diseases of digestion of, of the liver, and specifically for liver fibrosis, and also lung fibrosis. So it's a compound which is close to getting into, into the uh, human. Now the second one is, is a compound that activates the receptor. And you remember I mentioned to you that THC works on both, CB1 and CB2. I also mentioned that when the companies were trying to make these molecules, they were trying to make molecules that didn't have some of the side effects of the, the potent THC molecules. And they're trying to do it for pain. So we went ahead and created molecules that could recognize only one of these two guys, the CB2 selective compounds. We were the first to make CB2 compounds, AM1241, AM1710, two of them. And C. So we found out, and this is a discovery that we made with my colleague at the University of Arizona, Frank Poreca. Once we made these compounds that selectively go to the CB2, we want to test them. Do they work also for pain? Do they work for neuropathy? What is neuropathy? You know what neuropathy is. Pain that lasts a long time chronic pain, not too many drugs for chronic pain. 
THC is used sometimes for chronic pain, and you see why THC also has some CB2 in there. We wanted to make something more potent, more of that, and we made this molecule here, and tested it, and you see, here it is. This is my colleague, Andrea Homa, who tested it in, uh, in, uh, in neuropathic pain. In this case, the neuropathy comes, people who have cancer, develop in their extremities pain. And there are not really no good drugs for that type of pain. So, so Andrea has been testing our compounds in neuropathy, and it works very well. In fact, it works better than anything around. You see here, we have, this is a measure of pain. And you see, once you put a compound, then it gets, it gets reversed the pain. And the longer it can tolerate, the, the better it is. But if we then take the animal and take out the, the CB2 receptors, we do what they call a knockout. It doesn't do it anymore. So that animal which has been affected by that pain, the animal that has been affected by the pain, that was induced by giving them some sort of a medication for cancer, paclitaxel, and, and we know what paclitaxel is, it's part of Taxol. You've heard about Taxol. It produces these side effects. And we know now that it's produced because of the CB2. So when we use an R compound, we can activate the CB2, and it can become a drug. Same thing here. In this case, we put a, we put a CB1, a compound, a, a, a rat, a mouse, that you have, we have knocked out the CB1 receptor. If we knock out the CB1 receptor, the work still works, meaning that it's both through the CB2. So you see, we play these kinds of games. We make different molecules, and we use variations in the genes. In the gene, what you do is you can go to the particular gene, and there's a method for eliminating that gene. It's called a knockout. In fact, they can do it now better by eliminating only a certain parts. It's called conditional knockout. So you can really play a lot of these genetic games with the chemical games. So here, here it is. Uh, if we use if we use a CD1 agonist, it, it works on the pain, pain, but it produces all these undesirable side effects. So if we then go to CD2, this is 1710, I'll it doesn't do these, they're blocked, no side effects, and it blocks neuropathic pain. So, we had one, knocks out CB1 antagonist, we have a CB2 agonist, and the last one I want to give you here is a molecule that was created by blocking the enzymes that deactivate the endocannabinoids. Think about it, we have the endocannabinoids, an anamide, 2-AG, many others, and then once they're produced, they then attend to the issue there. However, if there are these other enzymes, that after they've done their job, these endocannabinoids have done their job, the enzymes then come in and cut them off. So what we do now, we do something indirectly. We go to these enzymes, and we block them. We make new molecules that block the enzymes. And if you block the enzymes, then the levels of these endocannabinoids go up. And you can get that in effect like you're activating CB1 or CB2. So in this case, this is one of our latest studies we did. We activate two enzymes. One is called FAR, fatty acid hydrolase. The other is called monoacetylglycerol lipase. We like these enzymes, we did a lot of work with these. We, we build them up, we make crystals of them, and so on. And I just want to show you an example of one of these that has been successful. And the way this is tested, this is, this is my friend Ben Baum, who is now in North Carolina. And this is a piece of the brain. It's called a hippocampus. Take the brain, cut a slice there, that's what you see hippocampus. Now, if you do bad things to the brain, things that create neurodegeneration, 
you kill the neurons. The neurons are all these little batteries in the brain that makes your brain work and all of that. And if you do bad things, for example, you could have Alzheimer or Alzheimer uh, or uh, Parkinson or some other indication, then your neurons are killed. So we tested them, and uh, he, so, so Ben creates molecules, uh, and this is caenic acid. We know that the caenic acid, which is attached to the thermatergic system, kills neurons. You can see them, I don't have a picture of them here, but you see how this is destroyed. If you pre-treat them with this molecule that we made, then they protect them. So first of all, we find out that we use our molecule, this is a new molecule we made for PO2. We have not this structure yet. But you can see when we give it to them, both of them go up. This is this how we measure how much of the cannabinoid we have here, the A or the 2AG. So we know that our molecule works. In other words, its job is to create more of these protective endocannabinoids. Now, what does it do otherwise? Then we test it on something called anticipatory nausea. There are people who feel nauseated from a variety of conditions. Also, the thought of one particular event can create nausea. It's called anticipatory nausea. So this work was done uh, by the Parker in Canada, and you see that if you use our compounds, they reduce all of this, and they work very well. So success, we have created a molecule that deactivates both of these enzymes at the same time. It's called mixed sediment. And sure enough, it works very well. And also, we tested it for seeds. So when you give this species, canic acid, it generates a condition with which the patient or the animal gets seizures. And it may be a source of seizures. It may be actually a way with which CBD works. We don't know yet. But we know that when we put this molecule in, canic acid, it produces seizures. And if we treat it with our compound, the seizures are gone. So that's the, uh, the, the event here. I gave you a little glimpse of these things, but we do this sort of work and fooling around. And by the way, science is nice because you can fool around with things. And we want to fool around with both. We want to fool around with, with a drug, but we also want to fool around with cannabis. Because there's a lot of things to happen with cannabis here. We want to continue doing our research on cannabis to find out what these other components of cannabis do, to find out how we can measure these components of cannabis. We can find out what CBD does. We know what it does, but we don't know how it does it. And we've heard stories that this, this, and this. We're still not sure about it. We're working very hard to see how CBD works, to see what's the best way of giving it, etc. And I think I'm close. Yes. So this is a group I work with, and we had a good time. And, uh, and, and they were involved in doing a lot of this work here. And then I also want to thank the uh, very important you guys, the US taxpayer, because we get all this work done with money from the taxpayer, money from the National Institutes of Health. Thank you.